First of all, there's a story behind the authoring of Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam Bukhari says, I'm sitting in the circle of Ishaq ibn Rahawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, and Ishaq ibn Rahawi, uh, after they go through their thousands of hadith, he says, you know, I wish someone would just collect the most authentic and reliable hadith in a concise way that every Muslim can benefit from. Just put the absolute most reliable hadith together that every Muslim can benefit from. Why? Because up until that point, hadith narrations were for the muhaddithun, right? I mean, they were just all over the place, these huge books, but the average Muslim really didn't have access to read books of hadith and things of that sort, right? So as Hakim al-Rahwai says, I just wish someone would do that. And Imam al-Bukhari was sitting there, and he says, وَقَعَ ذَلِكَ فِي قَلْبِي He said, from the moment my teacher said that, it, it just settled in my heart. So subhanAllah, that suggestion from Ishaq ibn Rahawi uh, earns him the reward of Sahih al-Bukhari because he was the first one to put that thought in Imam al-Bukhari's uh, mind and in his heart. Then Imam al-Bukhari sees a dream of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he sees this dream of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sitting down and there are flies in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Imam al-Bukhari has a fan in his hands. And he's moving all the flies away from the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he goes to a dream interpreter and he says, what does that dream mean? And they said, you are deflecting away all of the lies that have been attributed to the Prophet So Imam Bukhari was clearing those. And subhanAllah, that's significant. Because you compare that to a dream, because the ulama say the Prophet was saved in body and in teachings twice and both on the basis of dreams. The teacher of Salah al-Din, Nur al-Din Zaydi rahimahullah ta'ala, when he had a dream of two men trying to take the body of the Prophet and when he woke up, he sent people to Medina and he foiled a plot of the crusaders to take the body of the Prophet So that was one. And this one as well, when an Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala had this dream and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that uh, preserved the ahadith of the Prophet and the authenticity of the sunnah. Now when did he start writing Sahih al-Bukhari? At the age of 21 years old. So Sahih al-Bukhari starts at the age of 21 years old. He went through... 600,000 ahadith. He went through 600, this is how he's going to go through the process of elimination. 600,000 ahadith. He goes through and he finds the absolute most authentic ones to a degree of rigorous authenticity to a point that not a single person would ever question these ahadith. He makes ghusl, he puts on perfume, puts on his best clothes, and before he places a single hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, he prays two rak'ahs of istikhara asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. So that means there are over 7,000 hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. That means that's 14, at least 14,000 rak'ahs of istikhara <laughs> before placing those hadith um, in, this, uh, in this compiled work. The full name of which is Al-Jami' Al-Sahih Al-Musnad Al-Mukhtasar. I expect all of you guys to memorize this now. Al-Jami' Al-Sahih Al-Musnad Al-Mukhtasar min hadithi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or min umuri Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sunanihi wa ayyamihi Alright, can you guys repeat that? Al-jami' al-sahih al-musnad al-mukhtasar min hadithi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sunanihi wa ayyamihi which means the abridged collection of authentic ahadith with connected chains regarding the sayings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his practices and his times. Now after he compiles this work, here's what he does. He sends a copy to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, to Ali ibn al-Madini, to Yahya ibn Ma'in. So he sends it to the three most prominent hadith scholars of that time to be checked after he finishes compiling this. After these three great hadith scholars went through it, they sent it back and between the three of them, they disagreed with him on four ahadith. And then Imam al-Uqaydi said that al-Bukhari was actually right and they were wrong. So al-Bukhari proved that those hadith were also of the highest degree of authenticity. So subhanAllah, it's, it, so this is connected also to the previous generation, because they checked it, the great scholars of hadith, even before him, the older ones, um, they checked it. And this book became so important to the ummah that, that you know, and Imam al-Marwazi, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam al-Marwazi is one of the greatest Shafi'i scholars. He said that I saw a dream of myself and I was sleeping, in, and he said I was sleeping in front of the Kaaba. So he's actually asleep in front of the Kaaba, in, you know. And he sees a dream while he's asleep in front of the Kaaba, and he sees the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says to me, "Ya Abu Zaid, oh Abu Zaid, ila mata tudarisu kitab al-Shafi'i, wala tudarisu kitabi." 
How long are you going to teach the book of an Imam al-Shafi'i without teaching my book? All right. So Abu Zaid says, I said, Ya Rasulullah, awalaka kitab, do you have a book? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. He said, what book is that? He said, al jamia al-Sahih li Muhammad ibn Ismail. Go teach that book. So Abu Zaid continued to be a great scholar of, of, of the Shafi'i madhab, but he started, he went and he became a scholar in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari um, as well. And Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah says again, consensus, that every scholar considers this to be the most authentic book in the world after the Qur'an. How much does it consist of? Um, 7,275 ahadith, which includes the ones that have been repeated, because Imam al-Bukhari repeats ahadith in different chapters, and sometimes he puts the same hadith with a different chain. So that's 7,275 including those. Then after you exclude the repetitions, it's about 2,353 ahadith. And then you add, he also has some narrations from the companions, about 160 narrations from the companions. Uh, in total, you're looking at about 2,500 um, ahadith and sayings of the Sahaba in Sahih al-Bukhari when you remove um, all, of the, uh, all of the different repetitions. Now Imam Bukhari rahimullah, there have been PhD theses that have been written on how he organized his book. Every title is so meaningful and the way that he starts off is meaningful, the way he ends is so meaningful. So subhanAllah, he starts off with Kitab al-Wahi for example, the book of Revelation. The first hadith he mentions is إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ niyat. The hadith that in actions are but by intentions. And everyone will have only that which they intended. Why did he do that? For two reasons. Number one, to remind himself of sincerity, that if this is being done for anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will make this effort nothing. So he wrote that hadith there, and this became a tradition. Almost every book of hadith after Sahih al-Bukhari starts off with that hadith to clarify the intentions. Also, he put it there to show that the Prophet ﷺ was sincere, and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed revelation upon him. So even though it's in Kitab al-Wahi, and he narrates the hadith multiple times, he does it there. Also, if you're reading Sahih al-Bukhari, you'll see Bismillah at random times, and that's because it took him 25 years to write it. And when he took a break from writing for a while, then he'd write Bismillah again to indicate that he's starting um, over again. And then he ends his book, he ends Sahih al-Bukhari with the hadith, Karimatan, Habibatan, you know, that th th there are two words that are Khafifatan ala lisan, light on the tongue, Habibatan ila rahman that are beloved to ar-Rahman, Thaqilatan ala al-Mizan, and they are heavy on the scales, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al -Azim. Why? Because Al-Bukhari says, I don't want anyone to be overwhelmed, right? <laughs> this is... This is his way of saying that faith is easy, right? It starts off with a sincere intention and he ends off his book with a simple action. So Al-Bukhari, again, Sahih Al-Bukhari becomes the greatest book, the greatest collection that's ever been written. It has over 300 commentaries. The most famous one, which is Fath al-Bari by Imam Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala. And to understand the role Fath al-Bari plays, Fath al-Bari to the hadith of Bukhari is like Al-Imam al-Tabari is to tafsir. Like At-Tabari basically put all forms of tafsir into one tafsir and it became the, mothers, the mother of tafsirs. Fath al-Bari is the mother of commentary on ahadith. And uh, you know, it's such a powerful commentary that a recent, you know, a scholar that lived only a few hundred years ago, Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah ta'ala, someone asked him, why don't you write a commentary on Imam al-Bukhari, on, on Sahih al-Bukhari? He said, because the Prophet sallallahu said, la hijra ba'd al-Fath that there is no migration after the conquest <laughs> and Ibn Hajar already conquered it. Right? <laughs> there is no reason any, at this point to even write a commentary um, on it. So this is a very powerful book and it's not the only book he's written. Al-Bukhari has written numerous books. He's written Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, right? collecting the ahadith of manners. And he uses ahadith there that are authentic. But here's the difference. In Sahih Al-Bukhari, he has Kitab Al-Adab. He has the book of manners. But then he has Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. He'll put a hadith in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad that he won't put in Sahih Al-Bukhari. Why? Because the conditions of Sahih Al-Bukhari are so impossible to fulfill that literally out of the 600,000 hadith he studied, only a little over 2,000 could, could, could fulfill those conditions because the conditions were so stringent. So for example, the difference, why, why, why is Sahih Muslim not as authentic as Sahih Al-Bukhari? Even though if a hadith is from Sahih Muslim, we say it's authentic. Because Imam al-Bukhari introduced the condition to Sahih al-Bukhari that had never been found before. Which is that even if all of the narrators are of the greatest trustworthiness and of the greatest truthfulness, he has to affirm al-luqya, he has to affirm when they met, how they met, and when they sat together. 
which no one else had ever done. <laughs> Meaning, if there is a super authentic, like if Hassan al-Basri narrates a hadith from an, a companion, you don't need to know when, you know Hassan al-Basri, you know who he is, and you know who the companion is, that's good enough. And Imam al-Bukhari says, no, I want to know when they met, and how they met, so that I can put it in this particular book, so that no one can question it. And that's why the only one that would question, anyone that would question al-Bukhari is simply ignorant of hadith collection, and how it goes in the process of it.